It's an honor to have, first to be here in Manpac. I want to thank our superintendent for allowing us to be here. Um, and I just want to say that um, in the Senate District, you have a lot of districts, a lot of towns. And I know many of you are here. But when it comes to a consummate professional who's an absolute privilege to work with, this district and this community is blessed to have you. Thank you. And I, and I say thank that from you. the bottom of my heart. Um, and also, we have Senator Flanagan here. And because his, his time is absolutely precious, he had a, a very tough ride in the convertible on this beautiful day on the way up here. Um, so we want to make sure that he gets back on the road safely as quickly as possible. So as we go through the agenda, we'll just try to keep it tight and, uh, and move forward. And um, if you look at the end, the wrap up are action items, deliverables, and follow up. So this isn't just for the press, but we love the press, right? Um, this is actually uh, to find some deliverables to follow up and get something done. And to each and every one of you who came today, uh, I thank you for taking the time and, and doing that because I know, and I'm, I'm looking across at some very important people, um, I know your time is precious as well. All right, uh, without further ado, I'll turn it to our host, uh, Tom, and then uh, Senator Flanagan for a few words. Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for attending. Uh, this has been uh, one of the more publicized events with regard to the issue of mandates, both unfunded and underfunded. Um, I'll keep my remarks very short. I'm so happy that and, and appreciative that uh, Senator Ball, Senator Flanagan have been able to join us, and there are any other number of elected officials, including many school board members around this table and in the audience. Uh, our uh, whole purpose today is to raise awareness and then to, at the end of the agenda, come up with some uh, actionable items, things that we can actually be done or that we can attempt to do in order to relieve. In uh, the packets and uh, in at the uh, registration table, there was a chart, is a chart. It's called the Continuum of Educational Insolvency. And that's really why I wanted to focus on just for a second. And that it goes from left to right, educationally insolvent to that of educational insolvency. And this chart was uh, derived by Dr. Patrick Michael, who is the district superintendent for the uh, uh, Hamilton, Fulton, Montgomery, Bosey. So I can't claim uh, authorship, but I do credit Dr. Patrick Michael for putting this together. The bottom line here is that our state of New York has, has very high expectations for children's performance and therefore faculty and administrative performance in order to attain the higher um, expectations of the Common Core Learning Standards. Well, in order to do that, you need faculty, highly trained, highly certified, uh, well-motivated. You also need all the support services there, there too, and, and you have to have money to do that. And we know that we have a property levy tax cap, um, which was uh, something that school districts applauded uh, when it was created, knowing that there would be, or at least being told that there would be mandate relief on the other side of that, that same coin. And, and we have the levy cap, but we don't have the mandate relief, and that's why we're here today. But as you look at the arrow from the continuum, over time, as money becomes tighter and tighter and school districts have to cut back and back and back, eventually you will become educationally insolvent and you'll, do, you'll, you'll become educationally insolvent before you become fiscally insolvent. You can still pay the bills, but what's the quality of the instructional program that children are receiving? So I share this chart with you. There is appended to that some definitions uh, for your reference. We're very concerned uh, in, in, in public education here at Mayapack and in Putnam County and the Lower Hudson uh, in terms of, of educational insolvency. And, and we know that our school districts do a fantastic job of preparing our children by any measure for career and college readiness. We do. We absolutely do. We did that before Common Core Learning Standards, and we'll do it with them. But the bottom line is that in order to continue and maintain the excellence that we need and that we have, we have to be able to put a good program on the table for our children and their tax-paying parents. And we never want to get to the point of educational insolvency. So I share that with you. I want to thank you all for being here today, and I'll join the conversation as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Senator Flanning. So good morning, and thank you for the, uh, the invitation. I want to thank my colleague, Greg Ball. Uh, he and I speak regularly about issues involving education and government generally. And I want to thank the superintendent and, uh, for their, your hospitality. And it's a great turnout. Beautiful day, great turnout locally here. And one of the things that 
I think people overlook is how closely we work together as colleagues. We're not always in 100% agreement, but when you talk about things like education and mandate relief and proper and equitable funding of education throughout the state, that's something we all focus on very clearly and very strongly. Uh, I'm in my 27th year in the legislature, 16 years in the State Assembly, 11 years in the State Senate, third year as the chair of the Senate Education Committee. So that doesn't necessarily make me any smarter than anybody in the room. I just have some experience, which I think is helpful in dealing with a lot of the issues that we talk about with each other, but also on behalf of the people that we represent, whether it's our constituents or different levels of government, county government, town government, village government, and particularly school districts. So I'm going to kind of confine my brief remarks to school districts and mandates involving schools, but the superintendent touched on a couple of things that I think are incredibly important. Um, I sit as one of 25 members on the Governor's Education Reform Commission, have traveled around the state quite a bit, have traveled around meeting with colleagues in various schools and their administrators and teachers and parents in different parts of the state. And there is a certain uniformity. Every parent, no matter where you live, whatever your education, your income, doesn't matter the demographics, every parent wants great opportunities for their kids. And that's consistent throughout the state of New York. Every parent thinks that we don't put enough money into education, which probably most of the people in this room would agree with. So there, there are going to be some basic things that are very important for us never to forget. Um, New York State's number one obligation is the proper and equitable funding of education. I believe at the national level, a strong defense is the most important responsibility of the federal government. But here in New York State, proper funding of education and uh, appropriate access and opportunity for all kids should be our number one responsibility. That's a shared responsibility that is the governor, the assembly, and the senate. I am very comfortable telling you not only factually, but uh, philosophically and theoretically that the uh, New York State Senate Republicans and our majority coalition have been extremely outspoken and we have worked on a variety of issues that all of you pay attention to, things like high tax aid, the elimination of the gap elimination adjustment, what are we doing about foundation aid, how are we dealing with issues like educational insolvency and fiscal insolvency. And I'll use this school district as a perfect example. We have gauges that we look at. And I looked at some of the background on your school district here. We have a number called tax effort. And we benchmark that as a reflection of how much money gets put in at the local level as it relates to income. So your number is like six and a half. And you think, why, did, why does that matter? The six and a half means that you are a very strong locally based community that puts a lot of money in at the local level relative to what people make. People like Greg and I need to recognize that and work with our colleagues to make the point that when you talk about a school district like this, you're about average wealth compared to how the state defines it. You know, you're, uh, I think you're just slightly less than one. You have a building ratio around 0.47 or 0.5. And we can go back and comfortably say, these people are doing it the right way because not only are they asking for some help and relief, but at the local level, they're contributing a lot of local tax dollars. And you can't say that in all communities across the state. But the, the, very quickly, too, on the, the mandate question. The governor last year did two things, one of which was fulfilled, one of which was not. He said he wanted to have an education reform commission. He did that. He appointed 25 members. We had hearings throughout the state. We're doing more hearings now. And that work is ongoing. A draft report has come out. And there are some good things in there that were adopted as part of this year's budget. But as a parallel, at the time the governor spoke, he also talked about mandate relief in a generic sense and in a statewide sense. And his charge at the beginning of last session, not this one, but last year was, I want this done. I want 10 hearings between now and the end of the budget, and then I want an up-down vote on mandate relief before we leave Albany. That goes to the superintendent's point. That's something that we care about very deeply. The problem was the governor never sent us a bill. Now, we can put a lot of things out on the table, and I, if the governor was sitting right here, I would say the same thing. You can't ask for that and then not come up with legislation. Nothing was forthcoming from the executive that we could either accept, modify, or reject. In my, I'm giving you my personal opinion. I believe that if you look at who has advanced mandate relief, I would give the Senate probably a B or a B minus. I would give the governor a C, and I would give the assembly an F. 
The Assembly has thwarted every single thing that we've tried to do in terms of mandate relief. The Senate has advanced a number of pieces of legislation, some with very specific applications to schools and local governments. We've also put in legislation about banning unfunded mandates completely. Greg and I have supported a bill that I'm the prime sponsor of, which all of you who are involved in education will appreciate. You know the park testing that's coming, with all the computers and everything? Such a great idea, right? Everyone's saying, wow, this is awesome. We're going to get there anyway at some point. We put in a bill that said if it's such a good idea, the state of New York should pay for it. The state of New York should fully fund it. That, to me, and in terms of our discussion, that's the turning point on mandates involving education. If that's not paid for and that's not funded, tax cap or not, that's going to eviscerate any potential growth that you have and anything you want to do in terms of educational opportunity, and that even leaves out for the moment questions like educational insolvency. So I'm here as much to listen. Um, we have great dialogue back and forth, and I very much appreciate your hospitality and courtesy. Thank you. So you'll realize why if you have easy questions, they'll go to me, and if you have tough questions, they'll go to John. <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, you 27 years? He first ran when he was eight years old, so. Um, we'll go around uh, really quick and, and do introductions, and I also want to thank um, County Executive Mary Ellen O'Dell for having us here, and the Sheriff for not arresting us, uh, at least while we're here in the county, so thank you very much. Um, Really quick, for the press that's here, okay, if you can take a look, uh, as well as everybody, a lot of people say, well, when you, when you talk about unfunded mandates, what are you talking about and what are your proposals? And it seems to be a very general conversation from 30,000 feet. There are two documents in here. I'm not suggesting that these are my proposals, okay? That's why they say controversial on the top. And I'm not suggesting that uh, everybody ascribes to these proposals. But when you talk about specifics, there's one that says mandate relief controversial, uh, draft for discussion uh, purposes, and then mandate relief proposals, and you will see dozens of the proposals. Some of these have already been passed. Uh, some of this has, has already been, been worked on. Others have not. So if you want to look at the guts and substance, these are the, 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 this is the substance that, that needs to be uh, talked about. So we'll start at the very end and then just work our way down on the table. We can start down on the left. Just your name and, and where you're from, the organization, and, and then we'll get started. Yes, I'm George Griffin, Deputy Mayor of the Village of Mount Kisco. Hi, I'm Patty Ropke. I'm the Deputy Controller for the Town of Cortland, and I'm also a parent in the Maypac School District. Hi, I'm Lisa Davis. I'm Executive Director for the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association. Hi, I'm Andrea Peary, President of the Croton Harmon School Board. I'm Jay Zides. I'm a ninth grade special ed teacher right here at Mayapak High School. I'm Michael Hunt. I'm the president of the Mayapak Teachers Association and 11th grade U.S. social studies teacher. Hi, I'm Joanne Tumalo. I'm a community advocate and uh, more importantly, a parent of three children in the Mayapak School District. Hi, Jerry Hockman, superintendent, Bedford Central School District. Ray Sanchez, superintendent, Austining School District. Good morning, I'm Ginny Nasserino, Putnam County Legislator representing Patterson, also an employee of the Brewster Central School District. Anita Feldman, I'm a board member on Putnam Northern Westchester Boces. Hi, I'm Vince D'Ambroso, I'm the Mount Pleasant Central School District, board member of the Westchester Putnam School Board Association, and also a representative of the Putnam County Chambers of Commerce. Thank you. Good morning, Steve Jambor, President, Brewster Board of Education. Also, Vice President, Westchester Putnam School Board Association. Good morning, Susan Elion Wolin, President of the Board of Education at Bedford Central and President of the Westchester Putnam School Boards. Thank you for hosting this, and hopefully, something productive will happen. Good morning, I'm Jane Sandbank. I'm Superintendent of Schools in Brewster. Good morning, I'm Marge Horton, Dutchess County Legislator. I represent the town of East Fishkill. I'm the proud Nana of four and a half grandchildren. And uh, I just want to say that I am very grateful that this school district has welcomed us. And I am proud to say that one of my eight nephews is an employee of the school district. So keep on going. John Foreman, I represent the city of Beacon in the Dutchess County Legislature. Joan Coronado, member of the Dutchess County Legislature representing the town of Wappinger. 
Good morning, Deanie Labou, Putnam County Legislator. I represent District 8, which is the town of Mahopac. Sam Oliverio, Putnam County Legislator, District 2, town of Putnam Valley, small part of Carmel, and also an assistant principal of Putnam Valley High School. Good morning, Nick Bianco, Councilman, town of Yorktown, New York. Good morning, Terrence Murphy, Deputy Town Supervisor of the town of Yorktown. I would just like to thank Senator Flanagan and Senator Ball for holding this important mandate meeting. It is extremely important to not only Putnam, but to also to Westchester County. Good morning, Mary Ellen O'Dell, Putnam County Executive, representing the taxpayers of our beautiful county. Thank you, Superintendent Manko, always a pleasure. Senator Ball, thank you for your insight. Sheriff Smith for joining me today as we face many challenges. Today begins a day where we start to focus and break down our silos, which I think is very important when the school districts and our chambers of commerce and our local elected officials sit together and discuss the fact that mandates are affecting everyone, each and every one of us. And I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. My name is Don Smith, and I'm the sheriff of Putnam County. And uh, if we're doing grandchildren today, Jane and I are the proud grandparents of seven beautiful grandchildren. And Senator Flanagan and Senator Ball, Superintendent Manko, let me just say, that really is why we're here today. We're here today to make Putnam County, the Hudson Valley, our state and our country better for our most precious resource, our grandchildren. So thank you so much for mentioning grandchildren. Senator? Go Air Force. Go Army. <laughs> Raymond Cote, President of the Mayapac School uh, Board of Education. Good morning, Robert Allison. I'm Chairman of the Dutchess County Legislature. I'm from Poughkeepsie, and I'm also the Chair of Senator Ball's Mandate uh, Relief Council. Good morning. I'm Sandy Gale of New York State Assemblywoman, and I'd just like to throw out a suggestion that we should all think about is sharing services and coordinating more of our services with BOCES as an, uh, as an overall issue. Good morning. Earl Bellows, Trustee, Mayapac uh, Board of Education. Mike Scalfani, Vice President, Mayapac Board of Education, Chairman of the Finance Committee. Good morning, Tilda Zimmerman, Board of Ed Trustee here in Mayapac. Lucy Masoff, oh, sorry, Lucy Masoff, Mayapac School District Board Trustee. Leslie Mancuso, Mayapac Central School District Board of Trustee. First of all, I'd just like to take this time to thank you all for everything you do for the people of Putnam County. I really appreciate it. My name is Michael Neshwad. I wear many hats in Putnam County, of which one of them, I'm a local physician on the Board of Health, and I'm an elected official, county coroner. Thank you. And he's my doctor, so if anything happens. <laughs> <laughs> Not my coroner yet. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Mark Bukowski. I'm a trustee on the Mayapac uh, Board of Education, and I'm also an educator myself in the Yonkers Public Schools. Good morning, Patricia Caputo, trustee, Mayor Pack, uh, Board of Ed. Uh, good morning, I'm Carl Albano, Legislative District 5, which is the hamlet of Carmel, parts of Mayor Pack and Kent. I'm also a proud graduate of Mayor Pack High School in the old days when it started in eighth grade. Senator Ball, Superintendent Manko, thank you for inviting me. It's serious issues. Good morning, I'm Star Dineo. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Business at Mayor Pack. Good morning, I'm Don Beverly, an Assistant Superintendent here at Mayapac. Good morning, my name is Gunther English, I'm the Director of People Services, Mayapac. Hi, I'm Tom Hanahan, I'm on the uh, Mayapac uh, Public Library Board of Trustees. I'm also a proud parent of a school teacher here in uh, Mayapac High School. My name is Paul Eldridge, I'm the County, Putnam County's Personnel Director, and I have five grandkids. <laughs> I'm Bob Johnson. I'm a trustee of Port Chester Board of Education. I'm also on the West Chester Putnam School Board Association Executive Board. I'm also an educator. I teach science in Stanford at West Hill High School. Good morning, everyone. Anthony DeCarlo, Putnam County Legislator, District Number 9. I had four children come out of this wonderful school district. I am also an educator. I wore many hats during my career, uh, and I think this is probably the most important conversation we could have moving forward as a county government as local government, as a school district. This is where it needs to happen and moving forward in order to effectuate change. This is very important for all of us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Nalk with the Putnam County Chambers of Commerce. And I just want to echo the uh, comments of uh, County Executive 
Odell, that uh, the business community is definitely together with the municipalities and the school districts in getting some relief. We need the help. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm former Assemblyman Bob Castelli, representing Westchester County, and also for 14 years a college professor in New York. Senators, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come here and host this. It's incredibly important. And thank all of you for coming as well. Good to have you, Bob. Good morning. I'm Catherine Daniels, Board of Education for North Salem Central School District. Warren Lucas, Supervisor, Town of North Salem, also the Treasurer of East Hudson Watershed Corp, and we're responsible for all of the stormwater phosphorus reduction mandates that have come down, which affects a lot, every municipality here. So. Good morning, Ed Furman, Superintendent, Croton Harmon School District. Thank you for the invitation. So I think what we'll do uh, at this time is we're going to, at some point, open it up to question and answer. Um, and, and to get a conversation going, but I'd like uh, Senator Flanagan to, to make a few remarks. Yeah, a couple of things that I think are very important. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that there, there was at least one gentleman here is with the Teachers Association, and fundamentally there is nothing more important than having a good quality, effective teacher in front of the classroom. We can have beautiful buildings and things like that, but if we don't have good teachers, it's all, it's all for naught. So that um, is a tie-in to the whole concept of the level of dialogue. And we can go far afield on a lot of different things, but today is not the time to do that. We want to talk about mandates. There are clearly problems in education in the state of New York, whether it's educational or fiscal insolvency or issues like mandates. But I also think it's very important to maintain a professionalism and a level of dialogue that sometimes escapes some of our leaders in the state of New York. Um, talking about a death penalty for failing schools is not really going to help the level of the dialogue. And Thank you. <laughs> but that, that type of thing I think is very important. We can certainly talk about the problems that we have, but I also think it's very important to talk about the educational excellence in various communities, how that can be replicated throughout the state. Having said that, there are a couple of things that, you know, when we struggle about trying to find money. Last year we added about $750 million, about a billion dollars this year. We added on to what the governor had originally proposed, and he does deserve credit because the cap that we put in place tied to income growth, he pierced it in his executive budget. So that was a positive step forward. We worked well together and got some things done. And I recognize that most of the people here will say, well, we're still back to the 2009 levels. We still have problems. I'm not going to disagree with that. So part of our obligation is, how do you find flexibility? How do you find ways, like Semi Woman Gale have just referenced, it's about BOCES. How do you enhance some of those opportunities? Do you do it through financial incentives? And when you can't always give money, how do you provide flexibility and some additional authority or maybe some additional discretion? And we have had extensive discussions about things like regional high schools. We've talked about how do you deal with mergers and consolidations? Is it working well now? How could we change that structure? What do we do about the public vote? Should it be a vote of the continuum or the, all the school component school boards? Um, how do you provide financial incentives that have, can help school districts save money? How do you deal with things like distance learning and keep uh, quality education and a quality teacher in the classroom even when you have something like that? So there are a number of things that have come up and probably one of the most basic examples in the last year or so was APPR. When you talk about APPR, the Senate had advanced legislation not only in terms of the budget but specific independent legislation to say that school districts should be compensated for the additional costs. Now, all of you who sit, and I listen very carefully to the different capacities of people serving, there are so many examples where Greg gets this, I get this all the time. We have colleagues who say, we just want to do that. It's not going to cost anything. It's not going to cost anything. And you can talk about things like CPR. You can talk about things like MRSA and athletics. You can talk about teaching the curriculum about 9-11 and the tragedy and the history surrounding 9-11. But the reality is that somehow all of those things are going to cost money. It may be nominal. But when they add it up, that's where you start talking about real money and real issues. So one of the things that Albany has not done well enough is define what a mandate is. And literally, we have to do a better job to say, if it's such a good idea, let's figure out what it costs and then make a real determination as to whether or not the state should fund that. So one of the things that uh, had come up several years ago, I was in a meeting with Governor Patterson at the time and suggested that he issue an executive order that all mandates, whether it's county government or otherwise, be repealed in 180 days with this caveat. 
you have to demonstrate that there's a cost benefit and that there's some marginal but beneficial advance to doing something like that. If you're talking about education, how does it help a kid? If you're talking about health care, how does it help a patient? If you're talking about transportation, how does it help the driving public? And things like that. And I remember people scoffing at that notion, saying, you, you couldn't possibly do that. Of course you can do it. What's lacking is the will to do it at the state level. And frankly, we can do that as individual legislators. But if it had the imprimatur and the backing of the governor in particular, that would go a long way towards working with a lot of the things that are very important to you. So those are just a couple of additional background points. I think what we'll do is the superintendent had a presentation. Are you yeah. ready to do that? What I'd like to do at this point is just to defer to uh, Mr. Cote, our president, and Mr. Scalfani, our vice president. Uh, they have some materials uh, and some information they'd like to share. So, right? Good morning. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank all of my fellow board members and presidents for being here and superintendents. Um, beautiful day out there. I'm here today to support this. I thank everyone for coming. Um, in your package, there is a pack of papers that say Maytag Central School District estimated unfunded and underfunded mandates. And briefly, I'd like to thank uh, Stardinio our business official who spent oh. all right how about now all right uh, briefly I want to thank Stardinio who spent many many hours compiling this list of unfunded or underfunded mandates that we as a district face um, and before I turn it over to Mike I just want to say that many of the mandates were put in place to make sure that children get the services they need. So we're not here really debating the necessity or the, the uh, importance of the mandates or the statutes they're, they're attached to. But what, what we're trying to say is Albany needs to take a look at the fact that these are costing us significant sums of money. Money that would all otherwise be spent on programs for the children that they were put in place to protect and to help. Um, if you look at the last page, of the packet that I was referring to, you'll see some numbers there. And the estimated cost of the mandates that we face every year is a little over 23 million. Um, we get back from the state um, 5.8 million, a little under six, leaving us in a deficit of $17.3 million. Okay, so we have a budget of approximately 115 million. 17 million of it is unfund meeting unfunded mandates. <clears throat> that's an enormous percentage of our budget. That's an enormous amount of money to have to deal with as we prepare a budget for the next school year. And as Senator Flanagan pointed out, um, next year we, we have a huge mountain to overcome. We have um, TRS and ERS, which is the retirement systems. We have a, a, a deficit we're working up against. We were just found out that our ability to raise our budget has been cut significantly. We're now down to 1.6 instead of the 2.0 cap. Um, and on top of that, we have to worry about how we're going to get computers in the classrooms so children can take their tests, the regents and the ELA and the math tests on computers. So the, these are the challenges that we face. These are the things that we have to deal with. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to Mike now, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the mandates. Thank you, Ray. Um, although this presentation is 10 pages, I'm going to zip through it quickly. Um, if you take a look at page one, it's really an executive summary. It just gives you a flavor for what mayapac has been up against. And this could be any school in the state. We're all feeling the same effects. Um, we have to deal with over 200 unfunded or underfunded mandates. Um, the vast majority of cuts that have come have come throughout the district in various capacities, but in the past five years, we've laid off 40 teachers and five administrators. Um, we have a district that has been recognized for outstanding performance by Newsweek, but we continue to have to cut curriculum, we have to cut sports, we have to cut arts, and we're at a point now where there's nothing left to cut. So if you take a look at the next page, page two, this will give you a list of just some of, there's 114 on this page, just some of the federal um, and New York State mandates that we've been tasked with. And you can go through these on your own time, but just uh, a flavor for it. When you look at pages three, 
uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7. These are the effects of these mandates on MAPAC. There's 89 mandates here that we've spent enormous amounts of time trying to calculate what kind of funding we do get for it and what we don't get for it. But the, the, uh, the information is really summed up on page 8. As Ray said, we have approximately $23.2 million of mandates that we're up against every year, uh, of which we get about 5.9 million funded. So there's $17 million that have to come out of uh, the taxpayers' pockets. If you move on to uh, page number nine, what, what does that $17.3 million translate into? That's 155 teachers. That's basically a little bit less than 40% of our existing staff. It's 190, 67 passenger buses. We could replace our entire school district's fleet twice. It's two years of pension costs for our teachers and our administrators. It's 91 administrative positions. 30,000 computer desktops. 30,000 iPads. And 21 years of annuity uh, utility costs for the district. I think the bigger piece for me as a taxpayer and dealing with the, the people who live in Mayapak and the tremendous burden we have, um, I moved here 22 years ago. My taxes were $26,000 a year. I'm paying over $11,000 a year. About $8,200 of that is school taxes. If we were able to fund the entire gap of $17.3 million, we'd be looking at a 21% reduction in taxes in the, t in the town of Mayapak. That's a tremendous, tremendous amount of money. Now, we understand that, obviously, getting this entirely funded is not a, a possibility initially. But I think what we need to do, as Senator Flanagan and Senator Ball have said, we need to start picking away at this to start to get some funding in to get some tax relief for the community. We have people in our community that their houses being foreclosed on. I've had more than a handful of people come to me and talk to me about losing their homes and being forced out of Mayapak or Putnam County because they just can't afford it anymore. Um, that's a sad state of affairs. We are uh, very focused on not affecting the children and the curriculum and the arts and the sports, but I can tell you it's gotten to the point where it's very difficult not to affect them. So uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to, to thank Senator Flanagan and especially Senator Ball, who we contacted last April. Um, Tom, Ray, and myself, and said we need help with this. And as always, Senator Ball was there for us. We agreed to host this, and he's been nothing but uh, a tremendous support for Mayapac, and we thank him for that. It's nice that people actually hear what you want to say. It's different than my assembly days, huh, Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> um, without further ado, County Executive Mary Ellen Ardell. <laughs> Are you okay? We can probably, um, I think considering the fact that uh, both the sheriff and I share the burden of our county budget, uh, I think that we'll both, I think, work together and dovetail on, on our message. And uh, Sheriff, just feel free to jump in as I talk about points that I think are relevant to both of us. Is this mic all right? OK. Uh, Senator Flanagan, I apologize. I didn't welcome you. And thank you for attending this uh, forum. <clears throat> and again, it's very important to see today that we've all dropped our silos and we're all sitting here together, education department, business communities. And I do want to recognize and thank my colleagues on the legislature for supporting the initiatives as we move forward for uh, our 2014 budget. My administration is a young administration. We're in our second year. And we've worked very, very diligently to deliver a budget that did not exceed the tax cap. And again, I am very, very in favor of the tax cap. I think it is very important so that we can recognize efficiencies where we can achieve them. My uh, history in local government was five years as a legislator, and I was honored to serve in the Protective Services uh, 
commi uh, committee as well as personnel. And that is where I had found that there was an opportunity for some efficiencies to improve uh, transportation of correctional inmates to court appearances. And the sheriff and I, after five years, along with our district attorney and the support of the legislature, have finally received, and, and let me acknowledge support as well from Senator Ball and Assemblywoman Galef, finally received the, received the uh, approval and the blessings from District Court uh, Administrative Judge Shankman so that we are working diligently to provide initiatives so that we can meet the tax caps and we can meet the burdens. But at some point in time, we realize that there is no other room to go except to go up to Albany and ask for their assistance. Sheriff, we have also engaged in uh, dropping of the silos with the school superintendent, Manko, in the SBO program. And would you like to speak to that, Sheriff? Well, I, I would just say that uh, one of the things that uh, by having decisions made locally and not always responding to mandates, we don't have to go with the one size fits all. Let me just give you a quick example talking about the schools. Dr. Jambor is here from the Brewster Central School District. They have a unique situation with now one campus and what they wanted was an additional school resource officer because that worked well for them. Dr. Uh, or, or Tom Manko, the superintendent of the Mahopac School District and the board from Mahopac, had a different situation. They had multiple campuses where they could not afford to go with the school resource officer. And they needed a special patrol officer. So because this was not a mandated program, we had the flexibility, Senator Ball and Senator Flanagan, to make the right decision for both school districts. And I thank the county executive and the members of the legislature for not saying it had to be one way, that we could do what is right, do the best we can, because doing nothing was not an option. So that's just a good example. In, in I a, think it is. You know, yeah, I you. think it, it also shows that there is uh, collaboration within the elected officials in government, uh, not only in the local level, but in the county and the state level. I just want to touch on a few numbers. We have a $139.2 million budget, and after we pay our bills for the unfunded mandates, that leaves us with $22 million. As colleagues on the legislature, the sheriff, myself, and the other elected officials, our district attorney, so that we can provide what we believe are the quality of life programs in this county, including law enforcement, public safety, and of course taking care of our seniors in the Office of the Aging. Also supporting our not-for-profit groups, Humane Society, our museums, our libraries, all of the interests that we believe we came here or we stay here in Putnam County because those are the items that we enjoy. The most draining mandate on Putnam County is our share of Medicaid. New York is one of the only two states in the country who require counties to assume a significant portion of the Medicaid program. This year, 6,000 Putnam County residents are eligible for Medicaid. And the total cost, total cost for these $6,000, including the federal and state contributions, will be $93 million. Let me repeat that. 6,000 Medicaid eligible residents will incur $93 million in costs for the taxpayers. The Putnam County local share will be $9.8 million in 2013. That's 24% of our local property, uh, total property tax levy. So the Medicaid program is the creation of the federal and the state governments. They decide who's eligible, they decide what services will be covered, and they decide what service providers will be paid. And at the end of the day, Putnam taxpayers are presented with a bill with absolutely no input whatsoever into how we shape the program. And according to the federal and state regulations, even people with great resources, such as, as expensive homes, are eligible for Medicaid since Medicaid looks only at income. And I reference your action items, number 36, Senator, and I would ask that that would be a priority on behalf of the people of Putnam County and Medicaid to move forward for the mandate relief. What I think the sheriff said, and I will uh, definitely emphasize is that mandate relief must not come at the expense of our most vulnerable citizens, including children with autism, 
adults with brain surgery, jeopardizing the safety of our community, certainly not those who have developmental disabilities. And it, I just want to example this year, when Albany doesn't meet their obligations and they shift down to the uh, not-for-profits such as PARC. PARC came to the county legislature as well as myself and emphasized the fact that this PARC preschool, which is based here in Mahopac and has a history dating back to 1954 and served thousands of our region's children, was left to close. And that's because of an antiquated New York State Department of Education methodology that has left the school with grossly low rates to serve the children with the greatest of needs. And when it was announced that Park was going to close, the county legislature, the county executives, we all decided that we would be there to back them up and support until such time that Albany would recognize the methodology and the failure for them to support those children. The county's assistance of Park to cover the state ed shortfalls will actually save money for us in the long term. And the children with disabilities who have early education and speech and occupational therapies will more than likely mainstream into typical classroom settings. In addition to PARC, we have our outside agencies and we'd like to keep them open and to contribute to their funding at a level where they can operate efficiently, as I said earlier, naming a few museums, humane societies, and so on. Massive cuts are certainly not the answer, and quite frankly, I'm not sure that there is anywhere else that we can cut, as we've noted from the school's position. My administration will continue to work effectively alongside my colleagues on the legislature to maintain the tax cap. I'd like to believe that today we're all moving forward and thinking together and collectively. On October 2nd, I would like to invite each and every one of you to join me as I deliver the 2014 budget address alongside the county legislators. That um, address will be held at the Putnam Golf Course, again, here in beautiful Mahopac. Thank you. Thank you again, Senator. Rob? Uh, chair? You, yeah, I... Uh, don't want to upset the chair? Yeah, you know, uh, I think uh, Mary, Ellen, Mary Ellen and I are doing this together, so I, I okay. just thought I would yep. uh, have a few more comments. We, we only talked about the uh, school uh, security. Uh, first of all, I would like to again thank uh, Superintendent uh, Manko, Senator Flanagan, Senator Ball, a county executive at our legislature for all being here today. This is a very important day in Putnam County. And I want to say right up front that mandates uh, are not a dirty word. Mandates are not necessarily bad. The problem with mandates is if uh, you're in tough economic times and you don't have the money to make the decisions at the local level, then mandates can really cause tremendous problems for government. In the case of the Sheriff's Office, we have a number of mandates. We have mandates in the jail. In fact, as Dr. Mike knows, pretty much everything in the jail is under mandates. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because many of these mandates are really best practices. They're practices that we would implement even at our level. However, we have no flexibility because the Commission of Correction measures us against these standards and therefore unfunded mandates really put a noose around the neck of us at the county level, Senator Ball. We have mandates in the civil division, uh, you know, serving uh, county court jury uh, summonses, orders of protection. Uh, there are fees that have not been changed in 35 years that really amount to an underfunded mandate. The road patrol has 945 emotionally disturbed person transports. We have juvenile transports to juvenile facilities. And so these are things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. But the real issue for mandates for me are not the mandates that I have to deal with in the sheriff's office. The real issue are the mandates that the county executive just talked about. Now, whether it's County Executive Bondi, County Executive uh, Eldridge, or County Executive Odell, there's going to be a natural uh, tendency to have problems between elected officials and the county executive. You know, my father, the late Don Smith, was fond of saying, and I don't think he coined the phrase, but he, he loved the phrase, where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit. 
And so as the county sheriff, my focus is public safety, keeping the county safe, keeping our children safe, keeping our schools safe. And so I'm passionate about that. And so I have to deal with County Executive Bondi, County Executive Eldridge, County Executive Odell, and they come to me, and by the way, I did submit a budget that will help the county executive come under the tax cap. I'm mindful of that. But the point is, about 75% of the money is already spent before they even talk to me. About 75%. So when I'm trying to work issues in the sheriff's office and to keep the county safe, there's that natural problem. By the way, uh, Dr. Sandbank, I didn't mean to leave you out. I, I, I was just talking to doc, uh, Dr. Jambor. Dr. Sandbank is here from the Brewster Central School District as well, and uh, we've worked together on that school resource officer program as well. So the real issue here is county level of government is, was designed, counties were instituted for public health and public safety. But now we have all these other programs that we have to deal with. So we have a hard time funding public safety. And so that's where, Senator Ball, we, this, uh, these unfunded mandates really affect us. There's very little room when we come to the table at the county budget hearing. I have to tell you, though, just for the record, unfunded mandates are important. We need to solve them. But unfunded mandates really aren't the problem. They're really a symptom of what the problem is. If you really want to get to the root cause of unfunded mandates, and this is more complicated, Senator Flanagan, it really is. I'm, I'm really making this complicated, and I'm sorry for that. But the real problem is, is where we send our money. We send our money to Washington, D.C. We send our money to Albany. But we live in Putnam County. We live in the Hudson Valley. And then what happens is they put all these mandates on us. They make us apply for grants. And they give us aid. And ultimately, we can't make decisions right here in Putnam County and in the Hudson Valley where we live, work, and raise a family. So ultimately, this money has to go to Washington and Albany, and it trickles its way back. And at every level, there's inefficiency, there's waste, there's fraud, and there's abuse. So if we're ever really going to solve this problem, let's, let's work on the unfunded mandates. Let's work on them. Let's get them funded. Let's decide you know, what really helps and what's not a good mandate. But ultimately, if we're going to really solve the problem, if we're really going to make this great democracy successful for all of us and for our children and our grandchildren, then we need to fix the real problem. Follow the money. And let's keep more money at the local level for the county executive and the legislature to make decisions in the first place. Let's send money to Washington for our national defense and for programs that need to be done in Washington. Let's send money to Albany involving the state police and our New York State parks. But let's, let's get back to home rule. Let's get back to solving problems at the local level. Thank you very much for being here today. Let's continue to work on this issue, but let's also look at the bigger issue. Thank you, Senator Ball. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. I'll just, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, uh, we'll let Rob, just one sure. second, just to, uh, before we move forward. You know, I think it's easy to say uh, Albany, 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 like it's some monster hiding in a room. Uh, and, and you know what? I've been in Albany. It is a monster hiding in a room. <laughs> I think you said that, right. But Albany, just like if you have a county legislature where you have some person, now you have, you know, you got, you got uh, Sam who's independent and a fiscal conservative and he's the only Democrat in, in Putnam County and, and uh, you know, wildly successful. And you have, you have Deanie who is the maverick and you have different personalities. Well, we deal with 150 personalities in, in the assembly. We have 63 personalities in, in the state senate. 
and even working with it's 63 today right has that changed <laughs> and, and and dealing with the 63 personalities we passed a bill to end unfunded mandates in the senate so and i know sandy's here um and and she has you know always been a, a great working partner but there's a guy named shelly silver uh if there's a monster in the closet somewhere it's proud i'll just speak for myself it it, it, it may be him um, and that assembly and this governor need to make unfunded mandate relief a priority. So when we're saying Albany, 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 we need to also be constructive in how we lobby that. And we also, when we're talking about unfunded mandates, I want everybody around this table to go through this list of unfunded mandates. Because it's everything from seat belts for your kids to programs for special needs kids. So we can stop talking about getting rid of unfunded mandates and let's start talking about many worthwhile programs which would have to be cut or properly funded. So when we can get beyond the discussion of the monster in the room and unfunded mandates and talk about specifics, that's really the only worthwhile conversation that will bring anything uh, of merit to that chamber. You have a governor that has a council. The list is here, the list of the unfunded mandates. Some are popular, some are not. This governor needs to force an up or down vote in that assembly chamber and we all know his ability to force an up or down vote because we saw it on other issues where we disagree with him. And he can do it at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's done it before and he needs to do it again. Rob? Well, thank you, Senator. I, I think if there's something good to say uh, uh, for all of us is that we're not competing for mandates being brought down upon us. So we are all are in the same boat. This cuts across all lines. Uh, to the county executive's point, to the sheriff's point from, from Putnam County, it's the same thing in Dutchess County. Uh, the numbers may be a, a lot higher. Our, our budget's about $400 million, but it's the same exact situation. And with the school districts in the room uh, and the ones from Dutchess County that may not be here, it's the same thing. Uh, one of the things that the center and I talked about, and I'm going to be very brief on this, is that uh, with the Mandate Relief Council, what we should, we should do is we should really analyze things that we can probably make a difference in versus the larger picture of saying, well, we've got to do all these things at once, and we know that's just not possible. You can't even do that with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in education or government. So we want to focus on that. Uh, I am, am honored to be kind of leading that uh, cause uh, with many other people that we're, we're, we're going to focus on certain things, and we need to hear what those things are so we can advance those ideas to Albany because they're in the same situation that we are. They, they can't fix everything overnight, and if there are things that we can do to help Albany do those things, I think we're going to be a lot better for it, because the bigger picture will get smaller if we take some things out of that bigger picture, and I think that just doing things incrementally uh, actually uh, is, is more of a benefit to the work we're going to have to put into this. And again, thank you for being here this morning, and uh, it, was, it was good to hear from Senator Flanagan, and thank you for what you're doing in Albany as well. Senator. So we're, we're going to open this up to question and answer. Thank you, Rob. And, um just so you know, if you look at what Mayor Pack presented to us, I don't know how many, as elected officials, we go to meetings all the time, and you talk in circles. Mayor Pack went out of their way to actually provide a list. This is extremely valuable, and I thank you for the time and effort that, that went into this. Uh, just quick, because I forgot about it in the beginning, talking about a funded mandate, and it's not even a mandate, it's a funded suggestion. We have a program called Tough Kids I just left from. And we got $50,000 to combat childhood obesity uh, and childhood diabetes. And we're looking to engage school districts, to, so to all the superintendents and school boards and leaders who are here, please, if you're part of this program, we have money for you to, to be a part of this program. And also, just to follow up on PARC, we did work, you know, work together with the county executive, with the sheriff, with the county legislature, and our office is going to be announcing $100,000 for that program as well. Question and answers for John, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Okay. Oh my gosh. Hello. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Leslie Mancuso. I'm on the board. And I really want to thank uh, Mike and Ray. Um, for starting this discussion because as many of you know we had our budget meetings and it was really intense at times and we each have a fiduciary responsibility to all the students and the taxpayers and we're here talking about what can we do but it takes it really it's time to make it happen and I want to thank all the elected officials especially Ms. Galef who's here from the assembly um, sometimes it takes a woman to make it happen 
So uh, most of the time, all the time. <laughs> so I just want to say, um, with Ms. Galef and Senator Flanagan and Senator Ball, I really hope that after today and Mr. Rollison, that we actually do something about it and make it happen because we all, at the end of the day, we look at our tax bill and we look at our schools and we want the best of both worlds. And I think if we're committed and as school board members, they say it's a thankless job, you're a volunteer, you spend all these hours. But if you're doing it for the thanks, you shouldn't do it. You do it because you have a passion of doing what's right and you believe in what you're doing. So I want to thank my fellow colleagues and all the board members that are here today, and thank you, for everyone, for coming. And I have all your names, you so I'm counting you, on you. Do you have a question, Russell? Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? No, I just wanted okay. to say that. <laughs> what we'll do is, is Colin, that tall guy with the yellow tie, from now on, just raise your hand, and he'll, he'll just be the Phil, uh, Phil Donia guy. He'll hand you the mic. I have the mic, I guess, so I'll just stand up and ask. Um, my question is directed towards our elected officials, particularly at the state level. Um, as I told you, my name is Mark Pekowski, I'm on the Mayapak School Board, and I also teach in one of the big five school systems uh, down in Yonkers. And uh, what I see are school systems and towns all over the state reeling from the, uh, from the same problems. My question is in particular about the tax cap. Now, what I don't understand, and maybe you can clarify for me, is that when the tax cap was first floated uh, three, four years ago, we were promised that at the same time that the cap was instituted, we would have mandate relief. And that turned out not to be the case. So the first part of my question is, why were we allowed uh, you know, to have a cap, you know, we capped revenues without capping the expenditures, uh, that seems to me to be either a case of very poor negotiating or that there's something else, you know, that we're, that we're missing here. Uh, now, I'm a taxpayer. I'm a, home, I'm a homeowner. I don't want to see my taxes go up either. But it seems that if you're going to institute the cap, mathematically speaking, there is no way that our school districts or our county governments or our town governments can ever keep pace with the demands of the cap at the same time of rising, rising costs. So could you please address the issue of the cap? Uh, what was the intention of the cap and what you think are the unintended consequences of, of that cap now that it's been in place? Thank you. I would offer a, a number of different comments and I'm gonna to speak to education first. Um, I said this before, but it bears repeating. The single most important and effective thing we can do at the state level is to properly fund education. The more we put into public education, the less pressure there is at the local level, and that takes into consideration, consideration the tax cap. If you look at the state of Massachusetts, they've had a tax cap for a very long time, and they are one of the highest performing states in the country without exception. One of the primary reasons is that the state has properly funded education. So before we talk about any permutations or amendments or modifications of the tax cap, Proper and appropriate funding of public education has to be the number one priority. As to what you talked about in terms of the tax cap, no question. There was a lot of back and forth, and the list that we got here from one district is exhaustive, is beneficial, very helpful, but there are so many components to it, and that's one of the reasons that the governor came up with the Mandate Relief Council initially. The Mandate Relief Council came into existence before those series of hearings that I talked about, and the governor tried to advance that. The bottom line is that it, it just didn't, it didn't get out of the negotiating room. And I could dance around it a hundred different ways. You know that. But I also think there are some other things that have been advanced. We've tried to accommodate needs of school districts and local governments with regard to employee retirement system, New York State teachers retirement system, by advancing pension smoothing and doing things like that. We actually, a couple of years ago, put a bill out to provide flexibility to school districts that were previously given to local government, and the governor vetoed it, and we got killed for doing it. We were trying to do the right thing to help at the local level so that there could be pension smoothing. That has now come about, but the, the good part about that was that it was an option for schools. It was not a mandate. It gave them a choice, and if they decided to do it from a financial standpoint, that inured to their benefit. The tax cap, um, obviously, it is still across the state, doesn't matter what community you live in, tax cap is very popular with the public. 
It is, we can dance around it a hundred different ways, but in reality, every public opinion poll still shows strong support for the tax cut. Now, in a way, people don't necessarily want to hear this, but one thing that the governor deserves credit for in working with the legislature, for far too long, New York State would come and say, we're going to do it this way, but you have to do it that way. Don't do as I do, but rather do as I say. Since Governor Cuomo was elected, his first year was the toughest. He inherited a $10 billion deficit that was not of his making. And we have kept our own spending without a statutory tax cap underneath the tax cap level. So for the last couple of years, we have towed the line and been more financially responsible than fiscally responsible by, by leading and still trying to come up with money for things like education. When you talk about county government doing things to provide flexibility, um, things like CHIPS funding, there's a lot more CHIPS funding than there was in the last couple of years. That's very beneficial to the local taxpayers as well. So the, the mandate relief question, certainly not going away. This is a great list. I mean, I see things on here that I know like the back of my hand, things that I believe could be very helpful to change. But this is, I, I would gather that this is one of the primary reasons that Senator Ball put this whole thing together. So collectively, with a loud and strong voice, microphone or not, that people can um, have their voice heard and have some good beneficial things change for the positive. Um, Greg, can I make a statement after? Yeah. Bob Johnson from Port Chester, of Trustee Port Chester. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned with in our district is our need of grant money and it just seems that there'd be a really simple thing to do is eliminate all those requirements on some of those competitive grants. Some of the wealthier districts can hire grant writers and write for state grants and those are the wealthier districts. Our district is not as wealthy as some of the other Westchester districts and you know is, that seems to be simple. Why don't we are able, why, why can't we get grants based on need? Mary Ellen has a comment, and then Colin, you want to go over to the side? Okay. Is, this, is, this mic, is this mic up? I want to, I think it's important for everyone to note that when the first tax cap was delivered, it was 2%. And about 60 days ago, we received notice of, on the county level that the cap was, I believe, 1.66, Paul. So it's not 2% anymore. It's now down to 1.66, which when you deliver that message 60 days while you're already into beginning your budget process, it just continues to further the stress on, on your existing issues and, and forces you to go deeper into the cuts. And, and perhaps maybe you know, we could ask for some sort of um, legislation to get us to settle in on what exactly the cap is. Well, so a little bit more consistency, I think, would be helpful. It's, it was 2% or the rate of inflation, right? Right. Yeah. So the rate of inflation. I mean, I, But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It, it, it makes it, you know, as the sheriff said, and, you know, noting what we're trying to deliver as services by obligation, by the charter, you know, just by the mere fact that we're here to serve the people, it, it, it does have a dramatic impact. My 2% cap equates to only $750,000. And as the former county executive will tell you, and the legislature who's, who has already achieved um, progress with bu working on budgets, we're already done. We've already blown the cap with the pension and the Medicaid costs before we even sit down and open up the book for the budget. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you again for taking our questions. Jerry Hockman, Bedford Central School District. Well, a couple of my questions will not surprise you. There's two kinds of mandates. There are good ones that we wish others would help pay for, and then there are some that we wish were not mandates and they actually could come off the books, which would cost nothing. Um, I've asked this question before. I understand the lobby that disagrees with us on out-of-district transportation for students. Um, I do understand that. I appreciate that you fight for that, uh, for that group. I still do not understand why we are paying to transport children from the state of New York to the state of Connecticut to be educated. That's one question, which is number 59 on the list in the uh, Mayapac group. Secondly, there are several special education regulations and laws in the state of New York that exceed federal regulations. They are outdated, they are, and, and they are also inflexible. And those affect staffing that would allow us to staff the way with, that we know works much better. 
uh, similar to the comments that made before about SROs, that would provide a lot of savings and flexibility for school districts. Um, this one is out of your control, but I sure wish you would use your bully pulpit to stand up to the Department of Education in Washington to begin to get pushback on annual testing of students, because that is the that is the engine that drives the train for all of your spending. That drives 40% of the teacher evaluation system, which quite frankly will have little or no benefit in changing education and the quality of education. It's all based on testing. The annual testing pulls teachers out of classrooms to score them, additional computers, and it drives our curriculum. If there was not annual testing, a whole bunch of dominoes would fall, and that's something you could use your bully pulpit for, and one that we would like to have further discussions about is safety. Uh, we've all spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in the past six months to enhance our safety in our schools. However, that's just the beginning, and we will need help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Safety? Safety. Okay. 100,000 Yeah, um, very quickly to go back, competitive grants. Um, we shouldn't have competitive grants. We, I believe that we should be distributing money based on need through whatever the formula may be, foundation aid, whatever it is, that we can direct money to high needs districts. Now in this year's budget and last year as well, about 70% of the new money went to quote unquote high needs schools. So we are driving money to high needs schools, maybe not at the level that people want. We are, like everyone here who's involved in the public sector in particular, you compromise, you have to negotiate. The governor, when he came in, wanted a lot more money from competitive grants than we gave him. New governor, extraordinarily popular, pretty darn challenging to say no. Fundamentally, a lot of my colleagues believe that competitive grants are not the way to go for the reasons that you talked about. I'd rather take $250 million and further reduce the gap elimination adjustment because that has a tangible direct effect and then they're not competing against each other. We should have you know, competition in sports and clubs and things like that. We shouldn't be competing for base level funding. That's not, to me, that's not a philosophically appropriate way to deal with education. Um, relative to you, uh, non-public school transportation. Um, we have talked about this in the past. I remember being in another meeting with Senator Ball and there are a lot of reasons, um, probably many of which you are completely well aware of, but we have constant lobbying from non-public school parents and you because you happen to be in a border area that makes a, a difference but they are certainly outspoken they are very strong advocates and I could dance around in a hundred different ways right now I don't see that changing to your points about the federal government we could probably have a two-day long discussion at least on the efficacy or lack thereof or the value of no child left behind we are still living with the vestiges of that even as we change and transition and this is not really the forum to do it, but if I were to focus on one thing in particular, it would be the gross failure of the federal government to properly fund a lot of the regulations and statutes that come um, down from on high. And we certainly have done that here in the state of New York. I think we've gotten better at it. Some of the mandates that you now see come from the regions as opposed to the legislature, but the federal government in particular, not only in the testing area, but with all the things that are involving race to the top and ESEA and waivers and all that kind of stuff, as you well know, they have made it far more difficult for us to properly administer education here in the state of New York. Now, um, special ed. Uh, this, again, could be a very broad subject. If I were to, and I'm, I'm going to be very clear, if I were to do this, not Senator Ball, but if I were to put a bill in tomorrow that says we're going to go back and Anything that exceeds what the federal government requires, we're not going to do. There would be, I would be hung in effigy and maybe hung literally because you know the advocacy and the groups that will come out. And frankly, I don't, I'll surmise that there would be people here who sit as school board members and trustees who would also join that, saying that's not the appropriate way to go. It shouldn't necessarily be a shotgun approach, but rather a much more focused laser-like approach in terms of how we would do that. The regions have had some nominal movement in that area, but I couldn't agree with you more. There are a number of mandates that don't do anything for kids. They just don't. And that's where we have, you know, a lot of room for opportunity. Hi, I'm Anita Feldman. I'm on the uh, Boceo Board and I was a 24-year member of the uh, MAPAC board and had a privilege to be on that board for 24 years. 
Uh, we're talking about mandates, we're talking about money. I'd just like to bring something else into the, the talk, and that's the students, and that's our children who we service. I'm speaking for them. I, BOCES is a service organization that provides services that the districts, our 18 districts, can do collectively so that they can do more service for the students. And of course, the financial piece has been impacting what we could do for our districts. And we appreciate what our districts have, tr have tried to do for their students to get, you know, to provide them with our services. The students, if you hear them, the services that are provided from the local district and from BOCES, the kids say they are so pleased with the services that they get and that they, they, they like the fact, especially our seniors, that they are able to participate in these extra services or the extra services that are given through their district, the AP courses and all that, because this is helping them to become good students in, their, in the future, whether they go to college or not, whether they, how they work and all that. And I want to thank Senator Flanagan because we have, at our state organization, we have met then and he's always been very supportive supportive and Greg Ball, Senator Ball has uh, is supportive and he's sort of a friend of mine. <laughs> um, and I appreciate everybody here who came, the board members, the superintendents and all the people in the thing, but let's think about the kids because they really need us. You listen to them. I listen to them when they have their special workshops and their graduations and they all say that what they have been involved in has changed their lives and that's what we have to really put in perspective today. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to thank Senator Ball and, and Superintendent Manco and all the elected officials being here today. This is such an important event. And, and just uh, further going up on that is, to me, education is about the children. It always has been about the children. It should always be about the children. And today, I really feel that they are the victims, especially with the, the mandates and the tax cap. Uh, the district's hands and municipalities and local government, their hands are tied, even if they want to super, you know, override the tax cap, because you have the super majority that's needed. To me, you know, a democracy is a majority of the will of the people, not a super majority. And I was just wondering why it is a super majority to override the veto, and if there's any discussion, maybe to do away with that. I, I'm happy. Now, I'll say I'll, I'm happy to be unpopular. It really, I'm, I'm used to it. And I'll just say, um, because we had people that we have more New Yorkers probably in places like North Carolina, Arizona, and South Carolina, um, the people who were paying the bills and made a living who couldn't afford to live here anymore. Um, we needed a strong cap. And, you know, the discussion that we're having around this table where governments and school districts are saying, you know, we've, we're, having, we're forced to make very tough decisions. We've had to make cuts. We've had to lay people off. People in the private sector and people with homes have been doing it for a long time and much longer than many of the people uh, in, in elected office. And it's not a bad thing that we're being forced to make very tough decisions and live within the confines of a very strict cap. It's unfortunate that government didn't do it themselves, including Albany, for the past 30 to 40 years. Because maybe if they did, the people who left this state and took their pensions to other states and had to leave the homes and communities they built would still be here. So let's not get under any false illusion that we maybe have been making tough decisions now forced by a horrific economy for a short period of time, a finite period of time. But government avoided those decisions and school districts where you saw double digit increases for a long time. For, they avoided those tough decisions for a long time. So I'll be the skunk at the picnic. I've, been, I've done it before. Now that doesn't change the reality that this cap, uh, by forcing this serious discussion, there are realities of the cap. Back to the earlier point, we were supposed to give comprehensive, deep, unfunded mandate relief. You cannot have a property tax cap without delivering real, comprehensive, unfunded mandate relief. We in the Senate are partners to do that. If you look at the numbers uh, that Shelley put forward compared to the numbers that the Senate Republicans put forward, it's night and day. But we need a partner in this governor 
to force, if you look at the bill that's on everybody's desk, we passed a bill to end all unfunded mandates in the Senate. Put up or shut up. We put up and we did it. Now we need a partner in this governor to follow through. And quite frankly, because that cap is so popular, I feel like the governor believes that the mission is accomplished. The people who are upset are institutional folks for the most part that are upset with the cap, but the cap is still wildly successful. If you look at the difference in his demeanor, I speak for myself, if you look at the difference of his demeanor of saying that he's going to force an up or down vote and deliver comprehensive unfunded mandate relief to today where he basically says to county executives and county legislatures and the locals, he says, that's your problem. You've, you've seen it. Deal with it. Um, so sorry for being the skunk in the picnic, but Can I, answer that? Um, I just want to follow up on what uh, Senator Ball just said. At the time that this was all debated, there, were, there was a lot of consternation and frustration. And one of the things, and we're seeing this to some degree with Common Core and APPR, before the tax cap even really got started, people were saying the sky was falling. Now, if you look since it started, overwhelmingly school districts' budgets have passed. They've adapted. They've adopted. They've gotten um, sort of in line with what that was. But also bear in mind, too, the 60% rule was to make it harder, plain and simple. And there are laws like that all across this country, all of which have been upheld when they've been challenged legally. So while I understand it's a democracy, it was democracy in action, not inaction, uh, by an act of the legislature in concert with the governor. Bear in mind, too, that it was a five-year window, that it was tied to a number of different issues, including rent control at the time. So that was going to be reviewed down the road. Um, do I, I, I'm giving you my personal opinion. I don't believe that that, I don't see any significant movement in modifying the tax cap during that window. However, let me add one other thing, and this goes back a little bit to what the county executive said. When you talk about the 2%, and now it's going to be 1.66, I guarantee you when the governor comes out with his budget, he will be under the 1.66. Balance that by this. There are, t I visited a lot of schools where people said, 2% is not 2%. I have to go out and say it's 2.9 or 3.3 or 3.6. And that's true. But the reason that's true is because that's what you screamed for. You wanted flexibility on pensions. You wanted flexibility on judgments and things like that, enrollment and building. And we accommodated that. So we didn't do it without listening. We certainly understand that people may not want it at all. But on the whole, I would agree with the senator that it is still extremely uh, supported by the public, and it has proved to be effective. Ed Furman, uh, Superintendent of Croton Harmon Schools. I just want to address the, the tax cap in maybe a slightly different way. I certainly understand the popularity of the tax cap, but what I would advocate for, what I suggest is that it is a mathematical problem of which only one part of the equation is being discussed. The tax cap itself puts a limit on schools and, and municipalities and, and other, uh, uh, other entities. But there is no relief on the cost end. So with the rising pensions that are, uh, that are out of control, with the rising health costs that we have no relief for, the result is that the only place we can find the money is in program that affects children. That's the message that I want to deliver to you very clearly today. When you have a tax cap, fine. It's a limit on spending. But there's also costs that are involved in that equation. And there cannot be a discussion of a rational discussion about what's best for children without recognizing those costs that are part of the equation that are spiraling out of control, which there is no relief. My school district has actually pursued, and legal counsel has advised us that we can't, becoming a charter school district. We would be better off without the state education department, without living up to the mandates and expectations, and telling the state, keep its money, we could do the job better and cheaper. And I really believe that. And so that's the reality when you're at the local level. So we can talk tax cap all we want, but it's the rest of the equation that has to be discussed and can't be ignored. Thank you. Yeah, can I, um, I'd like to just comment on 
what you just said. There are, sometimes I think people lose sight of the fact that all the things that you're talking about affect the state of New York as well. We have rising pension costs, we have rising health insurance costs, and I guarantee you, and while I don't pretend to speak for him, the governor would come out and say that over the course of the last year, he has been a very tough, strident negotiator and has gotten better contracts that save the taxpayers more money, and he would correspondingly suggest that everyone at various levels of government do the same, and he would dare say, look at what we did at the state level. As state legislators, we pay our health insurance along the lines of what CSEA pays. I'm pretty sure that we are, if we're not the highest level of contribution of everybody in this room, we have to be right there. So on the pension side, we um, clearly recognize that and did the tax cap has an adjustment for growth in pensions based on the increase in the rate, as you well know. And I talked about the pension smoothing that was advanced before, but one of the things that is very vexing to raise as an issue I've listened to many school districts talk about pensions and they have no control over that. That's only partially true. There is a direct correlation between salaries and pensions. If you have 100 employees and they all make $50,000, if you have 100 employees and they all make $100,000, those decisions are made at the local level and it has a corresponding impact on exactly what your pension costs will be. Certainly New York State mandates the overall type of benefit, but again, if you have a very high percentage of employees, and I'll use Yonkers as an example, not to pick on Yonkers. Yonkers, the average pay in that school district is $92,000. It's in the top 20 in the state of New York, and I'm not suggesting that it should be to the contrary, but they're gonna have higher pension costs because they have higher salaries. So that is, you know, there's a lot of variables, and we are certainly cognizant of those costs at the state level. I am Yes, and I, I am But you've done a tier six for that. You you've addressed it through tier six. Yeah, well six. we yes. <laughs> We certainly have done tier five and most recently tier six. And I recognize school districts are saying we're not hiring people, so we're not going to get the beneficial effect. I'm acutely aware of the numbers that you're talking about because I have these discussions all the time. But if we're going to have a rational discussion, as you referenced, it is a fair characterization to talk about a correlation between salary and pensions. Okay, thank you, Susie. Yeah, I'm Carl Albano, Legislative District 5. When I look at the unfunded mandates, $23 million, we get back about $6 million, and the net cost is $17 million and change. The question I wonder is, how is that derived? Is it based on how much money comes out of a particular area? I think what a lot of people feel in this particular county or this part of New York, that maybe it isn't proportionate. We wonder, it seems that we pay more and we're demanded to pay more back. I'd love to see a chart how it works for all of the communities in New York State. Even when it comes to the grants, you would tend to think if a certain amount of money came out of a community, proportionately the grants coming back to that community would be the same. And there is a general feeling that that might not be the case. Money might be going to other areas. It seems like this is a backbone community supporting more than it should, or maybe more demands are, are being put on us than should be. Kind of, I guess what I'm saying is keep it local with the dollars and we can take care of ourselves. Unfortunately, we don't have that control. Is there a way to look at numbers to see what's going out as compared to what comes back in each community? And then people would have a better feeling that, okay, we're paying our fair share. We're not getting overburdened. Uh, let me, if I can, touch on that, please. Um, I, I would say, and I want to tell you this with a straight face, but hopefully with a little, little humor attached to it. In the time that I've been in office, I really, I can't recall an occasion where I met anyone who said they got their fair share. I really, and you know, but th that's part of the process. That's democracy in action. That's, that's why we have elections. That's why we change some of the things that we do. As it relates to your particular points, there are discussions all the time, ongoing issues. You talk about preschool and things like that. We have 853 schools, special act school districts. How do we deal with kids who have very acute uh, needs and disabilities? 
there are things that we are hamstrung by what the federal government says we have to do. But I, I, would, I would respectfully offer that while we don't do it perfectly, there is no question that there are constant reviews of every type of formula that's out there. The foundation aid formula, there's a lot of people who feel that it never met its goal. Why are we continuing to do it? Why do we have something as silly as the gap elimination adjustment? Um, how do we deal with things like schools that have a lot of children on free and reduced lunch? One of the things that Senator Ball and I had worked on was we listened to schools say, I have 50% of kids I know, but I only have 25% enrolled. So we tried to do something so that there would be greater recognition and a greater opportunity for a district with those type of needs to actually get the money that they're entitled to. There is always going to be that debate about regionalization. And if you look at one of the things that is unbelievable about the state of New York, and I'm just, I was driving up today across the Amvets Memorial Bridge on the Croton Reservoir, it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. New York State has anything and everything you could ever want. That's its blessing and the curses. We have anything and everything at the same time. So when you're out in Western New York and I'm dealing with rural schools and people who live in abject poverty, they're gonna look at, and God forgive me, I'm not sure how to pronounce it the right way. I don't know if they're gonna say Mahopak or Mayopak, okay? If I learn nothing else today, I'm gonna get out of here properly pronouncing it. But it's those regional challenges that um, really is underscores the diversity uh, in the state of New York. And I don't think that's going to change. And in some respects, frankly, I don't want it to, because that's why New York is still a great place to live. Yeah, just uh, a few follow-ups, uh, a couple of follow-ups. First, uh, the mandate relief controversial draft for discussion purposes. There are 18 items that are set forth. Numbers 18 and 19 happen to be two of the three uh, proposals that our school district submitted to the Mandate Relief Council. 18 is a men triborough and collective bargaining to exclude step increments and wage increases from continuation until new contracts are negotiated. We have to move probably the entire Rocky Mountains to take care of that, but I would, would be would re remiss if we didn't put that out there. Eliminate, number 19, eliminate last and first out requirement in school districts in New York City and cities over 120,000 population, 125,000. I would say eliminate last and first out for everybody. Don't make seniority the only criteria. Make it one of several criterion to uh, determine that. And, and that affects the school district's ability to control its costs. And then the third one that uh, the, the district submitted, it's not on the list here, but that was the um, uh, to amend uh, the change in burden of proof from parents to schools, which happened a couple years ago in terms of uh, unilateral special education placements. Our school district recently is under a, a, a special review officer uh, appeal to a, for a case that we, we appealed uh, that cost the district probably close to $100,000 uh, to, to uh, litigate a parent unilateral placement that we feel had very little, if anything, to do with the child's academic program. Um, and, uh, and now we're appealing the Ian Partial Hearing Decisions officer, Officer's decision uh, in that uh, the burden of proof shouldn't have to be on the school, it should have to be on the parent. Uh, those are three that are particular to our school district and our Board of Education. I think Mr. Bells, that was like two years ago we submitted those. That, um, and I'm not in any way saying that those represent the collective voice of uh, Westchester Putt School Boards, uh, Lower Hudson, Middle Hudson, uh, but they are on the list, numbers 18 and 19, two of the three. So uh, my sense of it is, is that we need to identify uh, several, at which I believe the senators have been saying to us, tell us which ones, identify which ones, and then we in the field have to make a concerted effort to let our elected officials know which ones and why need to be reformed. Uh, with that, on, on Mayapex website, we have on the home page under Quick Links a connection to the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association uh, website. And under there is a, uh, a, a link to um, uh, an interactive adv advocacy letter. So you can write a letter to our elected officials online through the generosity and auspices of Westchester Putt School Boards, and then you can send it electronically. So it's very easily done for you. Uh, my sense of it is, uh, is that the Lower Hudson Council of School Superintendents, Westchester Putt School Boards Association should 
continue our efforts to identify the, the, the two, three, four mandates that we, we wish to repeal. And it's, it's time to get busy because, uh, as Mr. Sclafani and Mr. Cote and the rest of our board know, we started the budget process for 1415 uh, May 22nd, the day after the 1314 budget was adopted. And we're all already looking at deficits of over $2 million with regard to pension costs alone. So budget cycle is here. We're getting ready for 1415. We need the relief now. It's not something that we will take whenever we can receive it, but we certainly could use it now for the 1415 school year. So I point out the interactive adv advocacy letter under Westchester Putt School Boards, and the link is on our, our website. Um, and with that, I, I, I'll, I'll turn the microphone back over to uh, Senator Ball. And again, thank the Senators uh, Ball and Flanagan for their representation here. They're always here and they always listen, and that, that's where you start. I just wanted to comment on several things that the superintendent said, and again, thank you for your hospitality. The, the governor advanced as part of his executive budget this year, and he put it out there. He didn't dance around it, he put it out there, a whole section of the budget on ability to pay. And everyone in this room knows what ability to pay means, but it's like beauties in the eyes of the beholder. How do you define it? He was castigated, he was roughed up, stood his ground in large part, and ultimately there was a compromise that primarily dealt with police and fire and law enforcement personnel, but he raised a very thorny, touchy subject, and there was movement. Not Herculean movement, but there was movement. So the governor deserves credit for putting something like that out. Having said that, on Triborough, there, um, it would be moving the Rocky Mountains, parting the Red Sea, a variety of other things, to see a change there. And I will say this, I think there are two components that unfortunately don't get proper attention. There should never be anything wrong with having a difficult, challenging discussion. There should be never anything wrong with that. If we're going to act like adults and we're going to maintain some professionalism and diplomacy, whether it's Triborough or special ed or ability to pay, there should be a healthy give and take. And I know people, to use my kids' phrase, freak out when some of these things come up. But I do think it's important. And I do believe that many people feel that Triborough should not be repealed, but rather simply amended to take out steps. I don't think school districts or local governments should be in a position where they could say, well, here's your health insurance. If you don't come to the table, we're taking it away. Nobody, I don't think any of our legislative colleagues feel that way. Um, unless the governor advances something on that, all of you know nothing is going to happen. I'm going to use last in, first out as an example. Um, a couple years ago, I had a you know, momentary lapse of sanity, and um, I advanced a bill for the city of New York. Put my name on the bill. And I'm not saying this in a selfish capacity, but rather to raise the point on what you just said about LIFO. At the time, the bill was solely about the city of New York. And it said that seniority cannot be the only criteria. It didn't say that you couldn't use it. It said if you, you cannot use that as a sole criteria. So if New York City or Mayor Pack under this bill came back and said seniority is going to be 95% and 5% are going to be other factors and that's negotiated, Fine. I got annihilated, annihilated by not only people in the teaching profession, but every labor organization across the state of New York. So every now and then when we stick our proverbial toe in the water and you have to duck so you don't get your head cut off, um, that frankly will make some of us a little more reticent to go out there if we don't have people behind us. So your collective efforts on some of these issues, and I'm not saying, you know, that we have to do exactly something like that, but again, there's an area where I learned a lot doing this, learned a lot in working particularly with the city of New York, but that was a microcosm of a much broader issue, and, you know, I still think there are opportunities to do a lot of good things, but I just, I want to thank Greg, and we obviously are going to continue to talk, and one of the good things about doing these types of forums is, particularly for education, Helps me learn. Senator Flanagan, is there anything in the form of a 3028 process which requires up to two years to fire a teacher? And why the salary is being paid to that teacher? And you can pay a couple hundred thousand dollars for the return to prosecute the case. You guys can do anything about that. Actually, in the last two years, we have done something about it. And we have streamlined the process. And I'd be happy to send you a memo detailing the changes in the law. 
And I do think there are other changes that need to be made, one of which is the bur um, not the burden of proof, but basically discovery rules that are for uh, civil service and Article 75 hearings are different than they are for education. I think the rules should be uniform. That's a personal opinion. I think a lot of people share that. But there are clearly have been changes, again, advanced by the governor, negotiated with, with the unions, and done in concert with the legislature. But Greg and I, we can easily send you an exact detail of what has been done. I'm not saying it's where it needs to be. And I do think we need to have due process and we should have protections in the law, but there's got to be a balance. And I'm not sure we're at that right juncture yet. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, we're, what we're going to do, because I know everybody has their, I know there are a lot of great ideas out there, and I also know all of you are extremely busy, including uh, Senator uh, Flanagan. Just two, two things. One, um, thank you for, for driving up here and doing this. And, uh, you know, I, um, we attack politicians all the time. And that's okay, because when you get into public office, that's what you're there for. But when you meet a gentleman like this, who is that this intelligent, uh, it knows the business, and does he goes to districts all across the state, and there's nobody who knows more about the topic in the capital or in this state than this man. And he could be out in the pub, in the uh, private sector, making a hell of a lot more money. And uh, it really makes you feel really good about public service to know that there are people like this uh, in, 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 in this state. So John, it's, it's awesome. I hate standing next to you because uh, <laughs> the way we're going to follow up, please make sure that we have everybody's email, everybody's contact information. We will send the complete exhaustive list. We want your input on that and then we will be following up with a session like this in Albany where you will meet with individual members and the governor's staff to ask for that up or down vote. Thanks guys. God bless. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Robert.